and welcome tonight to the South South, where four people have been reportedly killed following heavy shooting during the Ijo Youth Council in Port Harcourt. And four people die in Romania as torrential rains sweep through the central and the eastern part of Europe. And we also head to sports where cuttings are coming down on the sporting summer in Paris with a parade of French athletes on the Champs-Élysées as France throws its one last party to celebrate the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. And on business news tonight, the Naira finishes a volatile week uh, down um, for the week uh, despite the central bank's interventions. I will begin with politics in Edo State. Ahead of the September 21st governorship election, the People's Democratic Party, the PDP, has held a grand finale of its campaign rallies in Benin City, the state capital. The PDP governors led other party members, including former Vice President Atiku Abubakar, to declare their support for the governorship candidate and his running mate. <laughs> It's a massive mobilization of the PDP faithful in those states to receive the hierarchy of the party inside the Garrick Memorial Grammar School grounds in Benin City, the Edo State capital. <laughs> Mr. Obasiki rails out his scorecard in office so far. When I came, they said civil servants were corrupt. That civil servants were no good. They did not give them money. They did not pay their salaries on time. Today, don't we have the best civil service in Nigeria? The PDP governors say they're united and very much committed to ensuring that the party retains their state. states. There is no division in the governor's forum. And we are not pompous or proud. We are not arrogant. We are not joining issues with ignorant people. We are going to use the inside of knowledge and strategy and tact to be able to conquer. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar is optimistic that the PDP will remain at the Osadebe Avenue where its candidate, Sua Gadala, will hold sway. They threaten us. They said they will not allow us to win in Edo State. What did we show them? We showed them, say, they do not be Lagos. Lagos. Now, did we do it? We yes, did it. So. Did we do it? We yes, did. So. so this time again, we are going to show them a do not be Lagos. Lagos. The assurance of support is completed with the handing over of the party's flag to the governorship candidate. We have done it before. We will do it again. Good luck and all the best. Yes, sir. Yes. For Swag Gadala, the occasion is another opportunity to share his manifesto. We work out to remove suffering. We work out to remove insecurity. We work out to remove no school. We work out to remove bad health. We work every day for the people of this state. Every hour of each day for the people of this state. And we shall make ourselves accessible, transparent, and we shall work and govern with integrity. From the attendance here at the rally, the PDP is sending out a message to its opponents that it is ready for the governorship election of next Saturday. The All Progressives Congress, the APC, has also had its own mega rally in Benin City, the Edo State Capital, where the Vice President, Kashim Shatima, encouraged residents to vote for leaders who have their best interest at heart, as evidence in the APC's governorship and deputy governorship candidates. The Vice President mentioned this during the rally as the governorship election draws closer. <laughs> The All 
Progressives Congress APC Edo State mega rally, coming about a month after the party kicked off its campaign rallies across the state, draws party faithful and supporters to the sports complex of the University of Benin in Benin City, the Edo State capital. The Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Kashim Shetima, leads a long list of dignitaries, including Senate President Godzilla Pabio, nine state governors, the APC National Chairman, Abdullahi Ganduje, senators, ministers, and national leaders of the APC to the event. APC. The heads of the state and national APC campaign councils for the 21st September election captured the mission of the meeting in their speeches. Everywhere we have gone, Everybody keeps saying, go governors ended when Comrade Adamu Shokole left office. Today we want to restart. We want to reset our state. Bringing people who have the heart of flesh, who have compassion, and of course who have the track record. Former Governor of Edo State, Adam Sushomale, maintains that the APC has good plans for the state which would be implemented if its candidates are elected. Our message is a message of hope. We will not be detained by the very recent bad part. We are inspired by the evil. Once we have a vehicle properly positioned, a driver in the person of Akbako Rescue, Rescue Our Education, Rescue Our Infrastructure. The President of the Senate, Godzilla Pabio, also puts in a good word for the APC candidates. We have heard the news that Edo is taking a different direction. We heard that you have decided that it is time for you to rejoin the center. My presence here as chairman of the National Assembly is to come and let you know that I have implicit confidence in your incoming governor, Monday Okoyoro. The national chairman of the APC, Abdullahi Ganduje, says the party's candidates understand the needs of the state. The APC governorship candidate, Monday Okoyoro, as an other furrah, affirms his commitment to the development of Edo State if elected. We are voting for quality education for our dear children. We are voting for good health care. We are voting for infrastructural development. For the Vice President of Nigeria, Kashim Shetima, the APC candidates are the right fit for the governance of Edo State. Senator Monde Opebolo and his Deputy Honorable Dennis Idahosa, we have two gentlemen who will walk the talk. They will complement each other. The humility that has brought them thus far will also manifest in their governing of Edo State. With these two grassroots politicians and distinguished public servants, Edo will witness a positive redefining and reshaping of governance. Another highlight in the day's activities was the defection of two former federal lawmakers, Francis Alimihena and Omoegi Ogwedeyama, from Edo North and South Senatorial Districts, and the Action Alliance governorship candidates Tommy Segui, among others, to the APC. From politics to the flood disaster in Borono stage, the governor Babagana Zulum says the total number of lives lost is still uncertain as efforts continue to ensure areas not yet accessible will be reached as soon as possible. Governor Zulum has reassured the victims the government will come to their aid. The governor who spoke to Channel's television earlier today says that neglect of the dam over the years has been a major challenge and efforts will be made to remedy the situation. So you cannot just, you know, exonerate the common or any other person from mistakes arising from the flood disaster. So can you give us a chance so that we shall remedy the situation where human beings were not perfect? But managing an IDF camp is not an easy task. Managing human beings is not an easy task. Managing Nigerians is not an easy task. Those that are affected and those that are not affected are all driven to the caps. Distinguishing between the right hand and the left hand is the own problem. Distinguishing between the chaff and the grain is also a problem. 
but we are trying to you know, re-establish a machinery that will do the nitty-gritty. We don't have reliable data. You know, this thing has happened only three days. Getting the reliable data is not easy. So we are now trying to have a very reliable data on the victims because we have to be very careful. Right now, not all of the people that you have seen in the camps are affected because of poverty, amongst others. People do use to troop to the camps with a view to collecting food and non-food items. So I believe we are on it. I just left 4.30, 5.30 a.m. And we visited five camps and then uh, we have taken census of who is who in the camp. Very soon we'll wind up the process and ensure that we have a reliable data. That's number one. While the federal state government is also working on a social register, that is what we have been doing. We want to update our, update our social register so that we shall know the vulnerable population. We are trying to get them new numbers, amongst others. But no state is not lagging behind in terms of this one. Data is very important. We are working as to ensure that we have a very reliable data. But most importantly, we have established a committee on flooding since I assume duty. We'll expand the scope of the committee so we'll increase the membership so that these people will take data directly on the field, in the field. That is what we are planning to do. But now what we are trying to do is to manage those that are in the camp. And we don't want to keep people in the camp for a long period. As I earlier mentioned, uh, there's increasing uh, prostitution in the IDP camps. You know, there's increasing drug abuse in the IDP camps and progression without care in the IDP camp. We have seen a lot. It has taken a very serious time and very serious effort by the state government to close all the camps in Bonos in my degree. So will not allow reoccurrence of this situation. Whatever we shall do, we shall ensure that uh, you know, the camps should be a transient one, transitional one, that at most in two weeks, we shall reclose, we can close all the camps. And staying in Borno State, schools have been closed for a period of two weeks as a result of the flood. The State Commissioner for Education, Science, Technology and Innovation, Mr. Lawan Wakilbe, who made this known as the government is assessing the situation and if by Sunday, September the 22nd, the flood persists, then all schools will remain closed. Medugri is connected by two rivers, the Ngada and the Yazaram and both banks are full, so we are relying on seepage and we are relying on uh, our flood control mechanism to now divert the water. But some parts of Medugri water has significantly receded. In the case of children not going to school, when the flood committee warned the ministry that there is possible dike failure, the ministry took a proactive action by closing all schools for two weeks. So we are assessing the situation. By Monday the 22nd, by Sunday the 22nd of September, if situation doesn't improve, we'll extend the holidays. But if it improves, we'll go back to this. One part of the market has opened, but the remaining part is still flooded. And uh, you cannot cross to the third segment, which is the University of Maiduguri area. It's very difficult, except if you use boats or special vehicles or special excavators that were provided by the government. So complete normalcy will take some time, but partial normalcy we hope in the next one week to ten days. In part two, after the break, I Gimokode Foundation inaugurates the River Tyler's Aturu Primary Healthcare Center in Sabongi Daura in Edo State. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10. Coming to you live, terms the government will come to their aid. Police in Kogi State arrest suspects over the death of an undergraduate in Lokoja. And we've flipped to the south-south, where four people were reportedly killed following heavy shooting during the Joint Youth Council election in Port Akkad River State. And four people die in Romania due to floods caused by torrential rain sweeping through Central and Eastern Europe.
Nigerian Meteorological Agency, NIMET, has advised state governments in the southern region, especially in the southwest, to prepare for the second peak of rainfall. And this is according to the head of Climate Service Unit in NIMET, Mr. Oyegade Adeleke, who was speaking on our weekend program, Sunrise. Mr. Adele it will take at least 2,000 years for the ozone layer to recover completely. I will advise at this point again that particular attention should still be given to the outlook for the days to come. And the advice is used. Because if we pay attention to the outlooks for the days to come, we'll be able to ameliorate the suffering of the people, even if the situation arises. Yes, if the quantity of rain or amount of rain that will come down is known, it cannot be stopped, but measures can be taken to reduce the suffering of the people. For example, in Borno State, it will be very important for the dam managers in, all, in Borno State and other states to pay critical attention to the outlook of rainfall for the season. It should be in close collaboration with NIMET because this information is there, so that they could know what they should do about their dams. The people in the Southwest, the rain is still coming. The second peak is still coming. They have a dual season in the Southwest. So what you're experiencing now is the little dry season. The other peak of the rain in the Southwest is still coming. In the North, they have just one peak and they are at the period of their peak now. Hopefully, by October, this, the rains will start receding. By the end of this month, the rain will go down tremendously in the north. And it will peak in the south. So it is the right time for the south to begin to take measure, southwest especially, to begin to take measure that we make sure that the consequences of flooding will not be as drastic as we have in the north presently. About 40 persons have lost their lives in a boat mishap in Gumi Town, the headquarters of Gumi local government area of Zamfara State. The director of emergency at Zamfara State Emergency Management Agency, Hassan Doran, told Channels Television that the boat was carrying about 50 passengers when the tragic occurred. Well, an eyewitness also says the deceased are were going to their farms in the early hours of Saturday when the boat capsized and sunk into the river. The Emir of Gumi, just as Hassan Lawal, retired from the lease of those who lost their lives in the sad incident. The Aig Imokwede Foundation, alongside other healthcare delivery enablers, have commissioned the revitalized Atuhuru Primary Healthcare Center near Sabongi Daura in Owa East, local government area of Edo State. The chairman, Mr. Aiboje Aig Imokwede, said this in just one of such centers where the Aig Imokwede Foundation is intervening in primary healthcare delivery system in the country. A correspondent of Sazi Obazi reports. <laughs> Rulers, primary health care delivery enablers, representatives of the WHO, as well as members of the community are here. They are set for the business of cutting the red tape of the Otoruru Primary Health Care Center. The chairman of the Ege Mokwede Foundation, Aibuji Ege Mokwede, and his wife arrived at the Primary Health Care Center to set the event rolling. This marks a significant milestone in the great work that the Agit Mokwe Foundation is trying to do to improve access to health care. Various speeches follow by stakeholders and then the cutting of the tape. A facility tour of the health care center ensues. The chairman of the foundation speaks about the big picture of the primary health care intervention. Primary health care is the front line, uh, line of first defense. And if you deal with most medical problems at that front line, you reduce by as much as 80% the amount of problems that now go all the way up and require more expensive forms of intervention. And by that time, possibly, you know, the damage done to the human being has been very severe could lead to death. The Speaker at those State House of Assembly says that those State Government constructed the road that leads to the Health Center is elated about what the Primary Health Center here offers to pregnant women and the less privileged. First of all, the first thing that uh, you put on ground as a government 
is to, is to provide an, an access road. The pregnant women who will come and register here will not pay any dime to access any health facility here. Okay. Uh, the, the less privileged and also the, uh, uh, the, the disabled are also welcome here to access free health care centers. The CEO, Private Sector Health Alliance of Nigeria, Pishan, affirms private sector intervention in the primary health care delivery system. She hopes the benchmark could be reached. We call on to other private sector organizations and civil society members to join us on this journey to ensure that every Nigerian can contribute to nation building, can contribute to the human capacity development that we have in this country, and can access primary health care, which is the bedrock of the health care system of any country. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, private sector intervention is a good way of improving primary health care delivery system and the global world body is ready to partner with such initiatives. Usaze Abaze, Channels Television News. In the last 16 years, federal lawmakers have launched investigations into the alleged fraud in the nation's oil and gas industry, the outcome of which has left more questions than answers. Although billions of dollars of crude oil transactions lost since 1999 have been the subject of failed probes by various committees in the previous assemblies, the 10th Assembly has been undeterred, ruling out compromise in its latest pursuit. In the special report, a National Assembly correspondent, Gloria Mezuki examines the probes in the oil and gas industry by the National Assembly. Mystery and opacity, terms that have characterized Nigeria's oil and gas industry, is not an unfamiliar concern for Nigerians who describe the sector as one shrouded in secrecy, further complicated by the paucity of verifiable data. The quest for data in the industry, which remains a major source of revenue for the government, has been the basis of years of scrutiny by the National Assembly. Federal lawmakers empowered to appropriate and oversight to government revenue and spending have launched several probes that have failed to deliver positive outcomes. I understand what I was not here. Lingering questions and discontent on the efficacy of over a dozen of such probes continue to be advanced. From the time of Farouk Lawa uh, and several others in the past, and you could see uh, the role of corruption also in this whole exercise, uh, because um, there have been allegations that sometimes when these oversight functions are carried out, it's actually to brobeat the ministries, department, or agencies to come and settle them. We made it very clear. Anybody who is not guilty of anything should have no cause to worry. The Farouk Lawan case is one classic example pundits continue to use as an assessment. We require a lot of political will on the side of the executive, especially the president. So this time around, I want to get to the root of this. You must give the National Assembly that you know, power to say, I'm giving you the necessary support to go ahead, investigate this thing, work with my military, and let us see who and who is involved in this spillage of our God-given resources. Some of the major probes that were inconclusive under the 7th Assembly include the unremitted 20 billion naira proceed from NNPC oil money, which strained the relationship between the then CBN governor, His Highness, Alhaji Lamido Senussi, and the former president, Goodluck Jonathan. The Malabu scandal involving a former petroleum minister, Mr. Dani Tete, who was convicted in France for money laundering. The company is alleged to have received $1.1 million from the federal government as proceeds for the sale of an oil block. Conclude on which direction? I think the In the 8th Assembly between 2015 to 2019, a House of Reps ad hoc committee resuscitated an inquiry into the theft of crude oil, which was estimated to cost $17 billion. By 2019, lawmakers took another plunge into the sector. The Senate had set up a 13-man committee to investigate oil theft.
This is aside several other probes, including House probe on the defunct PPPRA for allegedly failing to remit revenue totaling 1.343 trillion naira to the federal government. The turnaround maintenance of the petroleum refineries in Port Harcourt, Wari and Kaduna at the sum of $396.33 million. The emerging reports again suffered the underlying setback of inconclusion. The NDDC uh, investigation, where did it lead us? The one in gas sector, where has it led us? What exactly is the problem? I, I, is it, it, does it have to do with the IOCs? Does it have to do with the operators? Does it have to do with the regulators? They need to come out clean and let us chart the way forward. Undeterred, the 10th Assembly, after one year of legislative sitting, has launched a fresh investigation to uncover alleged economic sabotage and abuse in the petroleum sector. I'm a bit skeptical, not because I'm, they are going to compromise, but because of the nature of the sector itself. People were involved, they are not just ordinary people. So I, I feel for the Bamidele members of that committee how they, we are going to penetrate the committee. I mean, they, I mean, they are going to penetrate the sector. How they are going to, you know, just ignore all secondary forces to say, look, we must get to the root of this sabotage. Probe after probe leaves a most distinct void after individuals, agencies and corporations are indicted by lawmakers. The implication of the wasted time and monies on public hearings and the abandonments is far-reaching as reports of corruption and obscurity continues to trill the sector. Gloria Umezuki, Channels Television News. The still ahead on the news at 10. The Naira finishes a volatile week down 0.93% despite intervention by the Central Bank of Nigeria. And that's some business news to join us again. Welcome back. The Senate Committee on Work says that it's impressed with the current pace of work on the LMA Ogoni axis of the east-west road in River State. They made this known during an inspection tour to assess the progress of the construction. Our correspondent Deborah Agbalama reports. The Senate Committee on Works, led by its chairman, is in River State to inspect the ongoing East-West Road project as part of their oversight function. The road which connects South-South states, passing through Fort Harcourt, Elime, and the Ogoni Axis has faced significant delays. The LMA Ogoni section, in particular, has been in poor condition, with work halting several times. Last year, the federal government disbursed an additional 33 billion naira to resume construction, but work stalled again in April this year. These delays had serious consequences for road users. In May this year, a fire disaster on this road claimed lives and burned several vehicles, highlighting the urgency for the project's completion. The situation seems different now as construction activities have resumed. Speaking to journalists shortly after the inspection, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Works, we Senator Marinada Mpigi, gives the impression. I can testify that what the ROCC is doing on this road with all phone, if released accordingly, the Ogoni people, the people of the River Southeast Senatorial District, the people of Akwaibon, of which the Senate President asked me to go and verify if he can pass through this road back home by Christmas. I can testify that if funds are released adequately, accordingly, with what is within the concept and the, uh, the purview of what they, the Minister of Works and the ROCC are together, all their releases are given. I think we, the Senate President can go use this road accordingly and go back home by December. An official of the construction company provided technical insight into the progress being made and the measures taken to prevent further delays. This is the first time the, uh, the company is trying a new innovation, that's a concrete, concrete improvement. We have to import a machine to do the job, and at the beginning, we have a teething problem. But now, we are on top of the, of the situation. We are doing very well. At least in a day, we are consuming minimum 30 tons of uh, iron rod. 
to do a job. So we are progressing and you can progress more as soon as, soon as we do, you have enough fund to do the job. On her part, the acting federal controller of works in River State, Enwerim Atalade, reaffirms government's commitment to ensuring that construction standards are met, especially at the critical sections of the roads. So much has been achieved. If you compare this road with the way it was some months back, it was immutable. Tankers were falling every day. It was always there in the news. It was a very big disaster to us. But as you can see, the situation has improved so much. And you can see the quality of work. We don't play with the specification and the standard. You can see this is um, a, a road that will last the test of time. With the progress so far made, the Senate Committee on Works is optimistic that the project will be completed in due course, bringing relief to road users and boosting economic activities in the region. Deborah Abalama, Channels Television News. The River State House of Assembly, led by Martin Amawile, says the State Investment Promotion Agency, which was inaugurated by Governor Siminalai Fubara, is a legal and alien to law. Condemning the governor's actions during plenary, the speaker accused the governor of running the state without respect for the rule of law and recourse to the legislative arm of government. It's another day of sitting at the Martin Amewuli led River State House of Assembly, and the chairman of the House Committee on Commerce and Industry presents a report from his committee regarding the formation of the River State Investment Promotion Agency by Governor Siminalai Fubara. In light of the vote, we recommend as follows that the House do consider the action of the governor on the inauguration of the agency. See, no inevitable. Reacting to the report, the speaker says there is no law creating the said agency and criticizes the governor for his actions. Every agency of the River State government must be a creation of law because the governor of River State has lowered the bar of governance. He has entered the trajectory of lawlessness. He does not respect the constitution. It does not respect judgments of the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal or the Federal High Courts. He's just acting like an outlaw. He also tackles the governor over the appointment of the board of the State Bureau of Public Procurement without due process. The world has seen that all we have been saying all along that there was never any public procurement board for River States. Recently, he went and appointed them, meaning that all that we have been saying to the world, to reverse people, that the governor has been spending funds without approval of the public procurement uh, agency. It's not clear to everybody that we are right all along. Meanwhile, the traditional ruler of Emoa Kingdom has praised the FCT minister for his leadership as he advised the speaker and his team to support him in developing the state. Quick is a man of great. God has put him up. People should not undermine him or many things will happen because what I see is a brighter star. Not all those people have seen so many things. That's yeah, what I'm seeing. I think I have visited the two worlds. I was there at the point I came back and I'm back here. And I'm happy to tell you, you will never regret being with him. At the end of the visit, the monarch and the speaker agree that there is need for everyone to work towards the overall development of River State. Charles Operum, Channels Television News. As Nigerians groan under the harsh economic situation, Imo State Governor Senator Hope Uzodima has assured that the policies of the President Bola Tinubu's administration will bring prosperity and stability. Governor Uzodima disclosed this at the Rear Admiral Ndube Sekano Square in Oweri, the Imo State capital, during the grand finale of the 2024 Imo Women August meeting. The governor likened the situation of the country to that of a woman in labor who goes through so much pain during childbirth, but after the Birth of the baby comes relief and joy. Our correspondent, Eitokwe Kutei, reports. August meeting is an annual convergence of large number of evil women at a particular period of the year, especially in August. 
According to history, it is a month-long celebration, a massive homecoming, whereby Igbo women within and outside their states travel back to their matrimonial villages to meet with their local counterparts to discuss matters pertaining to community development, conflict management, human development, and other socio-economic and cultural initiatives. Dressed in their beautiful attires, Imo women in their numbers gather here at the Undubusekano Square in Uweridimo, the capital, for the grand finale of this year's meeting, which is at the instance of the wife of the Imo State Governor, Chema. <laughs> Mrs. Uzodima, in her address, speaks on the essence of this year's theme, while also enumerates some of the milestones created for women in Imo State in the last one year. Dima, it's an opportunity to address Nigerian women on the current economic challenges facing the country. He urges them to remain hopeful and optimistic, assuring them that efforts are underway to change the narrative. Be it as it may, ranging from the exchange rate of the dollar to the high cost of living and products in the market, the time it takes you from the time you enter the labor room and the time you come out smiling is what it will take Nigeria. So I want to assure you, don't panic. Remain calm. In a very short time, the prices of foodstuffs will go down. As an offshoot of the 2024 Imo Women August meeting, according to Mrs. Uzo Dima, a total of 1,575 women will be empowered through a range of empowerment initiatives for SMEs, rural cooperatives, agricultural assistance, and financial aid to women traders. Channel Television News. To security matters now, the Kogi State Police Command has confirmed the arrest of Mr. Jeremiah Paul over the death of Mrs. Ms. Damilola Oloyo, a 100-level biology student of the Federal University Lokoja. Addressing journalists in Lokoja, the state capital, the police public relations officer, Mr. Williams Ayer, says the suspect, who is an indigent of Kaduna State, confessed to kidnapping late Ms. Oloyo and demanded 400,000 naira ransom from her family. Mr. Ayer explains how the suspect took the undergraduate to an uncompleted building and allegedly killed her after receiving the ransom. 20-year-old Jeremiah Paul, alongside his friends, are the suspects in the alleged murder of a 100-level biology student of the Federal University Lokoja, Ms. Damilola Oloyo. Ms. Oloyo reportedly went missing on September 4, 2024, after her second semester examination. The suspect had reached out to the family to demand for a ransom of 10 million naira. After days of searching for her, the police recorded a breakthrough with the arrest of the prime suspect, Jeremiah Paul, who led the police to where he reportedly dumped the body of the victim with most of her vital organs missing. I met her on Sunday, so I approached her, I talked to her, I collected her phone number, so we started chatting. So I told her whenever she's free, she should let me know. So I already had it on mind that I'm going to use that another. So I bought codeine and ritual. So I bought codeine and Sprite and mixed it up. So I gave it to her because I, I, I first drank it so that it don't look like I mixed something inside. So I told her she should follow me so that we should go over to my place. So when I get close to my house, where I live, there was an uncompleted building. So 
we kneeled on the wall, we were just talking. So gradually, gradually, she's feeling weak. Gradually, gradually. So Anna took her to the uncompleted building. So I strangled her to death. The knife I used to remove the part of her body, which is the eyes, tongue, lungs, intestine, and some part of her ass. So I put it inside the calabash and I wrap it. So I gave it to the driver, which he sent from Ibadan here to Lokoja. So he will be back to Ibadan. The operation of the State Intelligence Department led to the arrest of three others. On 4th of September, he met the disease, Abigail, Adamelola, and he lowered her. At first, he pretended as if he, he told her he liked her. And how much? At the process, after much talking, he lowered her into an uh, apartment. And before then, he gave her a drink. And unfortunately, unknown only to her, inside the drink, he has already put some codeine. And I also, also use this medium to call on the parent as well as the student that they should be aware of uh, uh, people they see around. The police is promising to prosecute all the suspects after investigation is completed. Let's head to Port Harcourt now, the River State capital, where four people have been reportedly killed following heavy shooting at the Joy Youth Council election. A correspondent who was at the Abuloma Model Primary School venue of that election reports that the exercise was going smoothly till about 100 armed men stormed the area, started shooting sporadically and pulling down canopies. Confirming the incident in a statement, the police public relations officer, SB Grace Iringe Koko, said the commissioner of police has dispatched tactical teams, but before the arrival, the perpetrators had gone into hiding. The statement also adds that the Commissioner of Police has given marching orders to track down the perpetrators and bring them to face the full wrath of the law. The command also advised all residents to go about their lawful businesses as calm has now been restored. Let's delve into the world of business. Laddie Williams is standing by to tell us about the local currency, the Naira. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Well, Nigeria's currency enjoyed a volatile week with seesaw movement uh, weakness this week, and uh, Thursday's gains actually wiped off. For uh, foreign exchange uh, trading at the FMDK exchange, it closed up positive this week as the total turnover of forex transactions uh, carried out rose to $1.2 billion as of September the 13th. This amount represents a 12.18% week-on-week increase against the $1.07 billion recorded last week. Meanwhile, the Naira depreciated by 0.93% to 1,629 Naira, 99 cobble against the dollar at a Nigerian autonomous foreign exchange fixing window. In contrast to 1,608 Naira, 85 cobble recorded in the previous week. And to the markets now, the Nigerian equities market ended the week uh, strong, up over 1%, and yet today's return rose back to the 30% level. Trading activity uh, was uh, quite uh, varied, with volume up and value traded took a hit. Um, sector performance was all green. Insurance, uh, consumer goods, industrial goods, and banking indices uh, all up for the week. On the Guinness chart, Coverton Offshore Support uh, Group led, while Learn Africa PLC topped the decliners. Uh, Jai's Bank PLC, Zenit Bank, Japol Gold uh, Ventures PLC were the most actively traded stocks by volume. And to the unlisted market now, the NASD OTC securities market's performance ended the trading week negative, as index was down by 0.88% week to date. At the same time, the volume of securities traded this week was down by 56.14% to 5.39 million units. The total value of transactions for the week that was down by 58% to close at 1.3 trillion naira, while the number of deals carried out dropped by 24.26% week on week. Top three advances for the week are Acon Petroleum, Afriland Properties and Industrial uh, General Insurance, while Arado Holdings PLC, UBN Property and Friesland Campina are the decliners on the NASD. Meanwhile, Arado Holdings was the most traded security for the week. And to the global oil market now, see earlier in the week, Brent crude 
Um, oil price dipped to a 52-week low of $68.52 a barrel, owing to cooling global demand, particularly due to economic struggles in China and Hurricane Francine, which caused significant disruptions in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, resulting in evacuation of production platform. Meanwhile, OPEC Plus postponed plans to increase support for prices, and Brent crude futures uh, rose by 0.8% for the week at $71.61 per barrel, while WTI closed the week 1.4% up. And Kenya and Germany have signed a significant labor migration agreement designed to tackle pressing employment issues in both nations. Kenya is grappling with increasing unemployment among its young professionals, while Germany is facing a shortage of skilled workers. This new deal will enable skilled and semi-skilled Kenyans to migrate to Germany through a regulated and targeted program. The deal, signed in Berlin by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz and Kenyan President William Ruto, simplifies the immigration process for Kenyans seeking employment in Europe's largest economy. And that's it for me on business. It's back to Anne with the rest of the news at 10. And in the world of sports, the first lady of Nigeria, Senator Loremi Tinubu, has commended Team Nigeria to the just-concluded 2024 Paralympics in Paris, noting their stellar performance shows the true meaning of perseverance, dedication, and true sportsmanship. She stated this while receiving the athlete. Sports development. This is uh, John Eno in her office in the State House, Abuja. The medalists at the Paralympic Games presented their medals to the First Lady, while she in turn presented them with flowers and gifts. Today we celebrate not just the medals, but the spirit of resilience that defines our athletes, and your names will be written in the annals of the history of champions. The Paris 2024 Paralympics marks the beginning of a new chapter for Nigerian sports. This success is a call to action for all of us to continue to support and invest in our athletes. We must ensure that the structures, resources, and opportunities necessary for their continuous growth are not just available, but enhanced. Our para-athletes deserve the very best, and we must strive to provide the much-needed incentives to celebrate them. In the English Premier League, Manchester United claimed the much-needed 3-0 victory over Southampton at St. Mary's Stadium. Matthias De Late, Marcus Rashford and Alejandro Garnacho were all on the score sheet for Eric Ten Hag's side. Elsewhere, unbidden Brighton were held to a goalless draw at the Amex Stadium. Crystal Palace also saw and played a 2-2 draw against Leicester City. In other matches, Fulham played 1-1 with West Ham United, while Nottingham Forest stunned Liverpool at 1-1. 1 0 at Anfield. Defending champions Manchester City came back from behind, but Brentford 2 1. Aston Villa came from two goals down to defeat Everton 3 1 at Villa Park. And in the last game of the day, Chelsea beat Bournemouth 1 0, courtesy of France forward Christopher Nkuku. Still outside our shores, four people have died in southern Romania owing to floods caused by torrential rain sweeping through Central and Eastern Europe. Emergency services confirmed that dozens of people were rescued from their homes in 19 areas of the country. But elsewhere, the highest flood alert was declared in 38 locations across the Czech Republic. Czech authorities say the flood barriers have been raised, canals have been closed to the public, while the zoo has now been closed in the capital, Prague. Since Thursday, Cyclone Boris has brought strong winds and torrential rains in part of Poland, Austria, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania and Slovakia. 
Russia and Ukraine have just swapped a total of 206 prisoners. This exchange, which is a second in two days, was achieved following negotiations mediated by the United Arab Emirates. According to the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, all 103 Ukrainians are military personnel comprising 82 soldiers and privates, as well as 21 officers. The Russian Defense Ministry claims that this set of returned soldiers were taken captive in the Kursk region where Ukrainian forces launched a surprise incursion in August this year. Cameroon's President Azali Asumani has been injured in a knife attack. Authorities are saying that he was stabbed on Friday while attending a religious leader's funeral near the capital, Moroni, but his life is not in danger. The spokeswoman, Fatima Amada, added that the president has returned home and the attacker has now been arrested. The motive for the stabbing is not yet clear and the attacker has not been confirmed, but the reports are suggesting there is a young military officer. And the main news again.